as a kid, um, it was our pastor at the parish, Monsignor Anthony S. Spina. <laughs> he was a Monsignor, but he would always kind of humble himself because he said, but my name is Anthony S. Spina, and when you take my initials, it says ass, and he says, and I'm a dumb ass, he would say to us. And, uh, but he was a role model. He loved ritual. He engaged rituals beautifully. And the pastor, the associate pastor with him, Father John DiCaprio, both of whom are dead, and whom I summon every morning uh, into presence when I pray for the dead in the morning. I do the Kaddish, the Jewish prayers for the dead, but I do it Roman Catholic style. And I summon both of them in. I call upon them. Um, but both of them loved the rituals of the church. And I, as a child, you know, you're in that state of consciousness of the magic, mythical stage, you know, the enchanted stage. And it, it, it became an increase of what I had done at four years old. Now I was in this beautiful building and there were these magnificent sounds from the choir and the, and the Italian community in Schenectady, New York, where I grew up, cherished the musical dimension of the rituals. And then there were the, then, then there was these, then there were processions and then there were uh, devotions to the mother of God and to the saints and there were bones of the saints that were there. And this was a, uh, this was a wonderland for my imagination. And it just kept blooming and blooming. And these two priests, Father DiCaprio and Monsignor Spina, were just enlightened in the sense of their love for these rituals. And then the rituals moved from Latin into English when I was probably around, oh, I was maybe 10 years old, a little less. And they moved into the new language of English. So the veil of the, the, the mystical language of the Latin was removed. And it was bittersweet because there's something about the, the not knowing what the words are saying cognitively that allowed them to be opened quite experientially to the whole other dimensionality, that other space-time experience. So both Father DiCaprio and Monsignor Spina made the transition beautifully. They, 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 were, they did a beautiful passaggio into this other world of the English rituals without losing some of the majesty of the processions and the incense and the music and the uh, preaching that they, would off, that they would do. That was highly poetic. Both of them were literary, uh, you know, they were savants f f about of literature and poetry. So they were able to do this. And, I just ate it all up. And, and then my father and mother did not want me to go into the seminary. They did not want me to be a priest. They wanted me to be a lawyer. They said, with the, uh, <laughs> they said with the talent that you have of imagining things, you can argue any case and win any journey, jury over to your side. So I, I didn't want to be a lawyer. I wanted to be one of those myth makers. I wanted to be one of those ritual makers. I wanted, to, I wanted to be an enchanter, a shaman. I wanted to be a priest. And I, and I felt that somehow, and this is certainly not part of our tradition as the Roman Catholic, but somehow it was a very ancient predisposition of mine to be this kind of ritual maker, priest person. It was there. And I, was, and, I, and, I, and I fell into a family system that was part of a parish system, that was part of a church system that kept nurturing this imagination until finally when I was graduated from public high school, because they wouldn't even send me to a Catholic high school. When I graduated from public high school, uh, I went to a seminary college, Siena College in upstate New York for four years. And then everything began to shift. It could have been physiologically that my brain was, the brain was doing its final stages of growth. But I was introduced to, I had been reading Watts since a teenager, but all of a sudden I was becoming aware of what was being spoken in these words. When he, when he said in a, it was a, it was a July night when my family was sleeping and I was reading this book by Watts called um, 
Beyond Theology, The Art of Godsmanship. It's a lovely book. It's still in print, actually. <laughs> and um, he, at the end of the book, he says, he uses a Buddhist frame of reference, and he says, we are God dreaming that we are not God. We are God dreaming. And I remember standing up from my seat at the kitchen table. Everyone was sleeping. This was probably 1 a.m. in the morning. And just going in front of the mirror and looking at the mirror. And it was this, and, and I had no idea of the Buddhist traditions of doing such practices. I just walked in and there it was. And then through my studies as a, as, as in Catholic theology, there was this magnificent paralleling going on of the mystical tradition where it, it moves from uh, 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 communion to union to identity with God. At that the indwelling of the Trinity is such that, you know, you hear Jesus say words like it's no longer, or St. Paul rather say words like it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, or St. Augustine saying those same experiences. It's like, um, it is that you, you, when we come to eat and drink the body and blood of Christ in these rituals, it is your own mystery. You become what you eat. You're Christ dead. And all of this mystical traditions that, that, that I was reading uh, in college and that kept coming up in philosophy classes, and then when I went to the University of Louvain in Belgium, because they sent me there, because the, bish the bishop said to me, you're a very good student. I was always a good student. He says, so you're going to choose where you want to go study for your major seminary studies. He said this. Do you want to go to Rome? And you'll be on the bishop track, <laughs> which I had no interest. He says, or you want to go to, I says, or do you want to go to Louvain or to l'Université Catholique in Paris? Then you'll be, on a, you'll be on a university track. I says, that's what I want to do. Because I knew I wanted to spend the rest of my life savoring and understanding what it was that in childhood I saw that Mirabar star moment of the veil lifted and something was there. And even now as I age, seeking it in this, in this sense of absence and in the shadowy places of my own uh, dying. Not that I'm dying in the sense that I have any type of disease that I know of yet, but in the passing of the years, this is why I love teaching a course on death to the millennials. I'm teaching starting on Monday at DePaul University a course on death literature. And we're reading Harry Potter Volume 7, because <laughs> the Harry Potter novels are all about this mystical death, the mystical transformation and the enchantment of the magic of our world if we are trained with the eyes to see, even as muggles. <laughs>